fun race week. The New England 300, a $77,000 attraction for the course tour at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway. More controversy and excitement at Riverside Park, plus an almost photo finish in the pros. And finally, a look at the Winston Racing Series Modifieds at the Thompson International Speedway. come to New England, and with the hot, steamy temperatures of the summer months, we're in for great racing action in motorsports, too. Hello, I'm Ben Dodge, and I welcome you to yet another edition of Race Week. Well, this edition of Race Week begins right here at Riverside Park and Riverside Park Speedway. There's a brand new water slide ride that's located directly behind me, and that kicks things off for the hot summer months. Well, if you think the ride behind me looks exciting and thrilling, you're in for a real treat, because we're going to show you motorsports that's just as exciting as the water slide itself here at Riverside. Because on this edition of Race Week, we were scheduled to bring you the NASCAR Winston Modified Tour for the Stafford Motor Speedway. Unfortunately, the competitors were only able to get some practice sessions in as thunderstorms came in and forced the event to be postponed and rescheduled for July 21st. But what we will show you is great racing action here in the Northeast as we take a look at an event that paid a $77,000 first. It was the ACT Course Tour event for the Beach Ridge Motor Speedway. We'll also take a look at the first appearance in 25 years of the Lima Midgets at Riverside Park Speedway. Now combine that with a look at some dirt track competition and maybe even a surprise, and you've got a great round of racing action on this edition of Race Week. But right now, the racing action begins right here on the pavement at Riverside Park Speedway. The distance was 50 laps for the Mighty Modifieds in the Carl Chevrolet presentation of another exciting round of competition. Tim Maroka and Wade Cole would be making up the front row with heavy favorites like Paul Barreri and Jerry Marquis in the middle of the pack. Off the turn and out in front, it was Wade Cole quickly into the lead when Tim Maroka would get crossed up and go around with car number six. Cole was still setting the pace when John Zavisa would dive to the inside of Joe Rezatek to try to take over second. Dan Avery was also on the move, and so wasn't Bob Poverary. Front five cars were starting to string it out now when Bruce D'Alessandro would try to hold his groove on the inside. John Cody would get a tap from Stan Greger, and Cody would get crossed up and literally stop on the racetrack. Brian Schofield would also get backed up on this move, but John Zavisa would become the brand new leader off turn number four. It was Paul Verreri who was now challenging for the number two position. Jerry Marquis was stuck to the outside, and Dan Avery was down low. Eric Leclerc would then go around in turn two, bringing out yet another caution in the event. Back to green, Bob Poverari had moved to the inside of John Zavisa. Both were feature event winners. Sparks would fly and Poverari would take over the number one spot. And Dan Avery would fight back on the bottom to work his way into second. Jerry Marquis, meanwhile, would be developing a problem. Reggie Ruggiero was slightly off the pace, then Zavisa would make the move and make contact with Poverari. Dan Avery would squeak by. Paul Verreri would cut an inside front tire as Jerry Marquis, Reggie Ruggiero, Stan Greger, and the field would manage to get by. John Zavisa would set stranded on the racetrack as Satch Worley would make contact, and so wouldn't Brian Schofield. Zavisa would then head back to the pit area. But back to green up front, a new challenge was on as Chris Kopech was trying to work the inside of Stan Greger. Jerry Marquis would then get a little bit out of shape as Reggie Ruggiero was coming from the back and picking them off one at a time. Ruggiero was on a quest to the front of this field. Now he would move in and take over position number two. Reggie Ruggiero would battle with Wade Cole lap after lap and finally take over the second spot. But Wade Cole would then be pressured by Chris Kilpack. Jerry Marquis, Chris Kilpack, and Wade Cole would come together between turns three and four. This caution would come late in the event, and on the restart, it would now put Reggie Ruggiero to the inside of Dan Avery. Avery would definitely be impressive on the restart, holding off Reggie Ruggiero as Stan Greger was still waiting in the wings. Dan Avery was long overdue for a victory, but definitely the class of this field. He would set the pace, and Ruggiero would try in the closing laps of the event, but Dan Avery would take down the victory. Reggie Ruggiero in for second, Stan Greger was third, Ed Kennedy was fourth, and S.J. Avonson would finish in the fifth spot. Well, anytime you got Reggie Ruggiero behind you, you know, you got your work cut out for you. 
Yeah, we had some action there. Uh, the John Savisa and Bob Poveri got together. I got by that mess, and you know, when 10 laps to go, I was going to hang on for the win any way I could. When the leaders got tangling like that, how close was it for you? Real close. I only had about a foot. Uh, Poveri got together over there in turn two. I just missed that by about a foot with my right front, and then we come back around John Zavisa. Something happened to his car. I missed him by about a foot on the other side, so it was pretty close. It looked like you and Reggie were both doing quite a bit of slipping and sliding near the end there. Were you out of tires? Yeah, there wasn't much left, and when I saw the flagger put out the 10 to go sign, I says, I gotta use up a little bit of real estate here and hold the reg off. Pro Stock main event was next on the card, and Fran Farina would be setting to the inside of Rick Turcotte in row number one. Tony Membrino in the second row, and outside of him was Eddie Kozo. When the field went to green, the challenge was for the number one spot, and Turcotte would try impressively to hold off Fran Farino. They come back to the line pretty much evenly matched as Dave Caruso was already threading his needle through the back of the pack to get to the front of this field. Brian Trundle was also coming on strong, and so wasn't Jerry Marquis. But up front, Turcotte would develop a problem. Slam the wall off turn number four with car 57, bringing out the first caution of the event. Back to green, it was Chris Kopech now in command with car number M6. Fran Farina was right there on his back bumper, and moving in the challenge was car number 17 for Eddie Carroll. John Lobo Jr. was also coming on strong, and so wasn't Tom Rosati, who was working the inside groove impressively. Lap after lap, Tom Rosati was picking them off one at a time as Rosati would get hooked together with Farino for a moment, then take over position number two. Eddie Carroll was fighting with John Lobo Jr. as Jerry Marquis was running strong to the outside. Closing lap of the event, side by side to the wire. It was Tom Rosati by inches over Chris Kilpeck to finish in the number two spot. Finishing in the third position was Fran Farino over John Lobo Jr. in fourth and Mark Farino to round out the top five. Tommy Rosati, they don't come much closer than that one. No, they don't. That's what we call clean racing and uh, hard racing. Looked like a little bit of contact coming off turn four in the last lap between you and Chris Kopek. Is that just a product of short track racing like this? Yeah, Riverside's a real short track tight, and uh, you're going to come together like that. You've certainly had your work uh, cut out for you in that one. A lot of traffic before you got to the front. Yeah, it was pretty hard. Traffic was real heavy. We worked our way through it. Uh, 15th lap, we had a caution, and uh, we were looking pretty good after that. The battles in the late model division were just as impressive. G. Perry and John Johnson were battling for front position here when suddenly Perry would develop a problem and dive to the center of the infield. This would put Frank Littwell into the number two spot as he would challenge. Three wide was the story further back in the pack, but it was Frank Littwell in search of his first feature event victory to take over position number one. John Johnson would try to fight back on the outside and Tom Carey would move in down low. Three cars bidding for the number one spot. But Latrell would still hold on as Tom Fern would work his way to the front of the field with car number 92. Robbie Bouchard was also running up very, very strong with car number 44. Then Dan LeBoy and Sonny Cuega would get crossed up and go around. No harm done there. It was Frank Latrell to hold him off to secure his first win ever. Tom Carey would finish in second. Tommy Fern was third. John Johnson was fourth. And Rob Bouchard would finish in the fifth spot. Up next was the feature event for the Mike Truck Stops NEMA Midgets as they were set to go. Brian Caruso would be in the front row with Doug Cleveland outside of row number one. Impressively, the field of winged race cars would come to the line and quickly jumping out in front was Brian Caruso. But into the number one turn, a challenge was already on. Howard Bumpus would work his way to the inside of car number 87 for Doug Cleveland. Bumpus was on the move. Cleveland would drop back just a bit. Then Jeff Horn would show some life. But quickly to the outside would go Caruso as Babe Shaw would work the inside through. It was car number 23 for Brian Caruso. Then suddenly Babe Shaw would slingshot down low and take over position number one. Jeff Horn was right in the fight. When down the back straightaway, Bumpus would go up over a wheel and go around with car number 66. This would bring out a caution and tighten things up once again. But back to green flag conditions, it was Babe Shaw now in command of the event. Then suddenly Joey Coy would work his way to the front. Coy would dive down low underneath the number 47 of Horn. As Horn would fight back, Coy would get out of shape, correct the automobile, and come back and rejoin the field in about the 10th position. But back up front, it was Jeff Horn, the leader of the pack, as he would set the pace. Meanwhile, Drew Fenora was picking them off one at a time when suddenly the inside suspension would develop a problem. Drew Fenoro's left front wheel kept kicking back on the automobile. As Reggie Ruggiero driving the backup automobile, car 45 was now among the top five cars in the field. 
but way out in front. It was Jeff Horn who secure and hold on to win the first feature event of the midgets. Joey Coy would finish in the number two spot. Babe Shaw would finish in third. Brian Caruso was fourth, and Reggie Ruggiero would finish fifth. No doubt about it, the Midgets put on a great race program at Riverside Park Speedway. And congratulations to Jeff Horn for securing that impressive victory. Well, next, we're going to be taking a commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to try to find out, with $77,000 on the line, who's going to become the winner of the New England 300 for the Coors Act Tour at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway. Ricky Craig, that's my best. I'm going to win. I'm going to win the New England. Boy, I don't know. I hope it's us. God, I wouldn't bet against me, but uh, it's a tough field today, so keep my fingers crossed. Probably one of us. I hope it's me. Jean Paul, who's going to win the New England 300? Myself. Only guy you can win that race, that's me. NASCAR Tour Type Modifieds, Exotic ASA Type Pro Stock, Action Pack Late Model Streets, and the all new Strictly Stock at New England's most successful quarter mile, the Riverside Park Speedway, Route 159 in Agawa, Mass. Each and every Saturday night, it's short track racing at its best at 6 o'clock only at Riverside Park Speedway, where action is the attraction with four divisions of excitement each and every Saturday night. It's Riverside Park Speedway, Route 159, Agawa, Mass. Sprint, Midget, and Super Modified fans, here's a great deal on the magazine for you, Open Wheel. For only $14.97, you'll get a full year. That's $20 off newsstand prices. Plus, you'll get these free racing decals with your paid subscription. Old-time stories, technical articles, and what's hot in today's fastest cars. Read about the drivers. Call 1-800-453-7800 now for Open Wheel and get your free racing decals. Have credit card ready, 1-800-453-7800, Open Wheel Magazine. Welcome back to Race Week. You know, I was just thinking about the question that I asked before the commercial break on who I thought would win the New England 300. It's a real tough decision. Now think about it. Is it going to be one of the heavy favorites like Ricky Craven, or will it be a guy like Russ Erland who's been so hot? Or how about Robbie Crouch? You know, the more I think about it, I think it might be a long shot. How about somebody like Buzzy Bizantzik? Well, only one guy will know the answer to this, and that's the guy who'll visit Victory Lane, as Dan Wolf will give us an exclusive look at the New England 300 for the Coors Act Tour. Dan? Perfect summer weather and a record crowd for the 18th annual Thompson Machine New England 300 at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway in Scarborough, Maine. Over 55 late model stock cars on hand to compete in the $70,000 event. In the AccuTrack Speed Trials, Russ Irwin set an all-time track record for late models on the third mile oval at 15.181 seconds. In the first of four qualifying heats, Jack Bateman passed early leader Gabe Gabry and cruised for the victory. In round two, early front runner Glenn Cusack took a lazy spin in the three-turn, collecting Joe Bessie. Back underway, leader Yvonne Bedard spun. He took Kelly Moore and Ralph Nason with him. At the finish, it was the veteran, Harmon Beaver Dragon, for the win, followed by Buzzy Bazanson and Kevin LePage. Heat number three saw Paul Richardson move from ninth to second in four laps. Richardson then battled the remainder of the event with Barney McRae. On the finish, it was McRae, Paul Richardson, Robbie Crouch, Jeff Stevens, and Jean-Paul Cabana. In the fourth and final heat, Rick Craven moved into the early lead and set a quick pace. Craven was followed across the line by Dave Dion and Bob Billadu. In the New England 300 Concy, Steve Knowlton of Ipswich, Massachusetts, motored around early leader Larry Hebert for the victory in round one. In round two, Kelly Moore in the Gardner Levitt 1X held off Bobby Gahan for the checkered flag. In the last chance race, Paul Johnson of Hollis, Maine, came back from mechanical difficulties in his heat race to claim the final starting position in the Riverside Winnebago Buick. 37 top late model stock car pilots took the green flag in what has grown to be New England's second largest late model stock car racing event. 
Bowl center Blair Bissett of Hudson, New Hampshire was the early leader. First caution on lap 14 for an incident with Larry Hebert that sidelined the 09 Buick of Rick Craven. Blair Bissett continued to lead through lap 23 when Canadian Claude Leclerc took over. Two more cautions on laps 34 and 41, both involving Jimmy Burns in car number 71. Fierce action up front as Jean-Paul Cabana took the lead on lap 45, only to have it snatched back on lap 46 by fellow Quebecer Claude Leclerc. On lap 71, Coors Tour point leader Ross Erlin of London, Ontario, Canada put the John Thompson Camaro into the lead. Caution again on lap 75 as Dan Beatty, Dave Bibbins, Herb Simpson, and Yvonne Bedard pile up in the three-turn area. Caution once again on lap 91 for the 11 car of Claude Leclerc. On lap 97, Buzzy Bazanson of Plastown, New Hampshire, put the DHS Holmes Camaro number two into the lead. At lap 100, it was Bazanson, Russ Erland, Robbie Crouch, Bobby Gahan, and Bob Bilodeau at the front. Caution flag on lap 158 for Jean-Paul Cabana, Robbie Crouch, and Gord Bennett. Only 18 cars remained at lap 250, and Russ Erland continued to dog Buzzy Bazanson. Erlen took the lead on lap 255, but Bazanson was back on top for lap 256. On lap 270, it was Buzzy Bazanson, followed by Russ Erlen, Robbie Crouch, Steve Knowlton, and Paul Richardson. On lap 276, Robbie Crouch used lap traffic to slip by Erlen into second place. But Crouch's tires were going away, and Erlen regained second place on lap 289 with the top four cars running together on the speedway. A last lap wall shot by Canadian Richard Thibodeau ended the New England 300 with the yellow and checkered flags waving. In victory lane, a jubilant Fuzzy Bazanson winning his third major race in three appearances here at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway. Bazanson took home over $17,000 for the win. Russ Erlin of London, Ontario, Canada held on for second. Robbie Crouch of Georgia, Vermont was third. Steve Knowlton of Ipswich, Massachusetts was fourth. And veteran Paul Richardson of Georgetown, Massachusetts was fifth. Buzzy, you thought earlier today that you could do it here in another victory at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway. I'll tell you, I really came uh, here with high hopes. We've run here before. I know the track. and. Uh, we put the setup in the car, believe it or not. George Church helped us way back in the spring. I gotta give him a little plug. He helped us put the setup in the car. It works. And uh, Albert, Jeff, and uh, the two Bobs, Steve, Dave, the owner. We got a good crew. We're, we're gonna be coming now, I think. Well, second place, I guess it was wrong with my uh, odds or my guess who I thought was gonna win, but Fuzzy drove a heck of a race, you know. He deserves to win. He got out front and he held out front and uh, if, to make his car work as good as he did, he did his homework before he came to this racetrack. And I got to congratulate him. I got to congratulate Robbie for running third. Glad to sneak by him right there near the end, but uh, I'm happy with second. I came here to win. Second's not as good as winning, but I'm still happy. Another tremendous afternoon of racing activity here at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway in Scarborough, Maine, this time with the running of the Thompson Machine New England 300. For Race Week, I'm Dan Wolf. The Thompson International Speedway hosted its second Sunday event of the 1989 season. Glenn Sullivan would be starting right up front as Al Smith would be in the outside row with car number 95. It was Sullivan who quickly jumped out into the lead into turn number one. Battle was still on when Sullivan would develop a problem as Bobby Georgitis would take over the lead as Sullivan would be forced to drop out of the competition. Bob Georgitis was a brand new leader and Teddy Christopher was hunting him down as moving to the inside was Jeff Berry with car number 22. As Berry was trying to hold on on the bottom, it was Eddie Spires to take over on the outside. Now a new bid for the lead. Here comes Ted Christopher off the turn like a rocket to take over position number one. Reggie Ruggiero would drop out and move to the infield with car 44 as Georgitis would spin. Tony Mordino would make contact with car number 52, ending his hopes of securing a victory. Off the turn, it was Teddy Christopher setting the pace, but Bob Potter was moving in on Barry. When contact was made, as Mike Christopher would get away, Potter would slide to the center of the infield with the course number 51. Back at green, it was Ted Christopher in command. Jeff Berry was right there on his back bumper, and Mike Christopher was running in position number three when suddenly Christopher would slam the wall hard with car number 82. Mike Christopher, last week's feature event winner, was now out. 
and Jeff Berry was making a bid for it on the bottom side of the racetrack, but Chad Christopher would be the man that would hold on to secure the win. Jeff Berry would finish in second, Chuck Doherty was third, Eddie LeClerc was fourth, and Rick Donnelly would finish in the fifth spot. Pro Stock feature event was up next, and Billy Matson would be starting right up front. Joe Nimorowski would be challenged immediately by Rich Wood. Dave Caruso, Tony Capali, and Rosenfield were also coming to the front of this back before lap number one was complete. Down the back straightaway, Rosenfield would make a bid for it on the inside when Wood would go sliding with car number six. No real damage done here, but back at the front of the field, Caruso was putting on some aggressive moves to take over the number one spot. Billy Matson had to settle for second. Tony Papali was looking good when Jeff Zydema would work to the inside of Rosenfield. Right there on his back bumper was Jimmy McCallum with car number 17. Then suddenly, Caruso would develop a problem and drop out of the event. This would change the complexion of the challenge at the front of the field. It was Jeff Zydema now in command. McCallum was running in second as Rosenfield was running strong. Then suddenly, McCallum would lose an engine. Joe Nimorowski had no place to go. In the oil, he would spin and drop out of the event. Tony Papali was now the new leader of the event, and he would hold on to secure the win. Jeff Zydema in for second. Joe Rosenfield was third. Jim Rosenfield was fourth. And Billy Matson would finish in the fifth spot. The late model feature event was a qualifying race for the $25,000 300 weekend for the late model street stocks. Out in front, it was Tony Sylvester to quickly pull away from car number 09 for Ed Harrington. Harrington was looking strong when suddenly Wayne Crawl would get crossed up in the middle of the pack and go spinning to the infield. On the restart, Ricky Sean would develop a problem. Dave Selleck would try to fight back and maintain his spot as Roy Scott Hanks would come to life, and so would Phil Rondo with car number 41. Three wide, then suddenly Sean would cut things off just a bit as Gomo would go to the inside with car number 16. Bobby Gomo would then try to battle back with the 16, but the challenge was already on up front. It was Chuck Zantarski who was trying to hold off for second, but Tony Sylvester would secure the victory with car number 38. Zantarski would finish in the number two spot. Ricky Sean was third, Dave Selleck was fourth, and Phil Rondo would finish in the fifth spot. It's good to see Tony Sylvester back in the winner's circle at the Thompson International Speedway. He's had a really tough season during 1989. You know, and what about that impressive pick for Buzzy Bazanson to win the Coors Actor event at Beach Ridge Motor Speedway? You gotta admit it, I wasn't too far off on that one now, was I? Well, next we're gonna be taking a commercial break, and when we come back, we'll be taking a look at Dirt Modifieds and that big surprise right after this. Racing is more fun when you know the inside story. Stock Car Racing Magazine takes you behind the scenes. Action from super speedways to America's short tracks. Award-winning Stock Car Racing Magazine. Colorful, exciting stories by the men who build and drive the cars. Call 1-800-441-3636 for a full year at only $14.97. Get a free racing patch with your paid subscription. Order now. Have your credit card ready and call 1-800-441-3636. Stock Car Racing Magazine. We're back, and it's time for more of the race week. As next, we're going to be taking a look at the Dirt Modifieds at Cayuga from Weedsport, New York. We're also going to be giving you that surprise that I've been telling you about. Well, I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, but I'll give you some of the clues. It takes three or more vehicles to get the job done, and they all have to be chained together. Well, I bet you're real puzzled right now, and you should be. Brian, tell us about this and the Dirt Modifieds from Cayuga. The two big factors Sunday night at Cayuga County were Jack Johnson in the BR DeWitt 12A and Kenny Tremont in the Duchess Overhead Doors Wonderlick Sand and Gravel number 115. Early in the event, Mitch Gibbs spun out, collecting Billy Decker's number 91. Both cars were fairly eliminated after this accident. Danny Johnson's woes continued. Motor problems put the 27J into the pit area by lap number 10. As Jack and Kenny worked their way through the field, Kenny tried every way possible to get by Jumpin' Jack. Eventually, on lap 14, Jack would get around early leader John Proctor for the top spot. Kenny Tremont would move up to second. Alan Johnson also looked strong this night. The Kyle of course, number 14J using the outside cushion here to move into third. Johnson would go no farther for the rest of the evening. Charlie Donk has been a consistent runner in Central New York so far in 89. Second in points at Canandaigua, fifth in points at Cayuga County. It was all Jack Johnson's night, though, as he took home his first of the year at the Weedsport Oval. Kenny Tremont was second, Alan Johnson third, John Proctor fourth, and Johnny Ventura fifth. 
Ben, this is the big surprise everyone's been waiting for. Train racing. But hold it, there's no tracks. There's no actual train. What it is is three passenger cars chained bumper to bumper. There's one person in the front car, one person in the back car, and they go racing. The front car has the motor and pulls them around the speedway. And sometimes it can even be a very frustrating thing, especially like these guys who had their battery fall out. Or it can even be exciting. Watch Kirk Eckcross, the number 27J, and John Harmon in the 7X take the lead on the outside of the speedway. They went on to record their second win of the year in train racing, a big time event for the amateur fan. For Race Week, I'm Brian Spade. Now that surprise was something special now, wasn't it? Well, next we're going to be taking a look at the midgets from Riverside Park Speedway once again. As Mark Warnes will be taking a look at a familiar face at Riverside driving a different type of race car. Well, you already know what type of race car, but you might be surprised on who was driving in the midgets. These are the midgets, a race car that travels from track to track week by week. Their engine sizes vary, four, six, or eight cylinders. Midgets are direct drive cars with no transmissions, so they must be push started. Meet Drew Finoro of Andover, New Jersey, the Northeastern Midget Association's top gun. 43 career wins and four championships in the last six years. Drew says midgets are like NASCAR modifieds in some ways, but different in others. You can move in and out of traffic a lot easier, a lot quicker. You can stop them a lot quicker. You know, uh, you can save them easier when they get in trouble. Uh, they're probably easier to drive than a modified. Modified standout Reggie Ruggiero strapped into one of Drew's midgets for the first time on Saturday. Being so small and light that the brakes work real good and the modified they don't work that good and the steering in the little midget car is real quick where modified is sort of slow like he says in slow motion. These cars are sometimes referred to as the wing midgets because of this wing on top of the car. Now the wing is designed to provide stability and help keep the rear end of the car down. It also provides a measure of safety. The car does have a roll cage, but if the car were to flip over, the wing would provide just an extra measure of safety and protection for the driver. And Fenoro can sum up the appeal of racing midgets. You know, we're like a family here, you know, my owner, myself, and, you know, it's, it's more than just racing. On this particular night, the student fared better than the teacher. Rogerio in the number 45 finished fifth. Fenoro in the number one had a night he'd just as soon forget. This is Mark Wernis reporting for Race Week. Thanks, Mark. Well, that's going to kind of wrap things up for this edition of Race Week. On the next edition of Race Week, we'll be kicking off America's birthday for the 4th of July holiday weekend as we'll be bringing you the Budweiser 150 from Riverside Park Speedway. A look at a major event of an Adnock Motor Raceway with 100 laps being the distance for the modified. Now combine that with the kickoff event for the Super Skull Dirt Series at Flemington, and you've got just the beginning. Add some more great racing action for the Coors Tour and Riverhead Raceway for the NASCAR Winston Modified Tour, and that's going to be the story for the 4th of July weekend with us on Race Week. Until then, we say take care, and we'll see you again next time for more of the best in New England motorsports coverage. Bye-bye now.